right, uh, we're in a series uh, from in Luke, from the head to the heart. Uh, we're in chapter 7, verse 36 to 50 right now, so let's uh, read through that, and then we'll make some observations. But before I make those observations, I just want to review with you the most recent thing that we've kind of been talking about, and that is the Jesus way. We've really started to kind of give some definition to the Jesus way. Uh, remember, when Jesus is preaching in the, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and then the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, Luke uh, 6, was it Luke into 7? No, uh, Luke, in, Luke 6, he is not sitting there going, oh, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. He's not giving us a lot of moral commands. He's already assuming those moral commands to be in place because they were in place. The law has already uh, given us those moral commands. And, and so there's also kind of an assumption that you're going to sin. This, these are the very things that you're going to do to one another. But as you do them to one another, then come, and instead of going your own way with, uh, with regards to your sin, come follow the Jesus way. Uh, now, here's a few things to remember when we talk about the Jesus way. One is you have to push past the recognition that you are simply, uh, you're more than just a physical being. You have more than just physical needs. And this is particularly troubling for a group of people. Wh which group of people is this particularly troubling for? The rich. It's difficult for the rich people to see past this because all their needs are met, right? And, and, and so as, as you look at it, they go in and they look in the refrigerator, they've got multiple choices. They look in the cupboards, they've got lots of choices. Their needs are met. They don't have any issues. And a lot of times they, they simply think, I, I, don't have, I don't need anything because all my needs are met. And yet Jesus is coming along and he's saying, no, your life is so much more than just a physical life. It is a spiritual life as well, and you have spiritual needs, uh, and you have to go beyond just the physical life, okay? That's part of the Jesus way. A second thing to think about is that you've got to go beyond the reciprocal motive, and we're going to see that in this story today uh, in, in Luke chapter 7. You've got to go beyond. A, a lot of times in life, it's like, oh, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. Uh, and I'll take you to lunch, eh, but I'm going to expect that you take me to lunch. Uh, right? You have all these different little things that go on, and it's this reciprocal motive, and that's very natural. It's a very standard way of, of, of operating with humanity, and yet Jesus is coming along and he's saying, no, 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 go beyond that. Go beyond just this principle of reciprocity and move past it. You're going to find uh, a beauty in life. Uh, also, go beyond your natural inclinations. The natural inclinations to judge and to condemn, they kind of go hand in hand. But we're doing it right now. We're, we're judging one another right now. Uh, we're judging each other on the basis of our dress. We're judging one another on the basis of where we sit in the, in the church. Isn't it great that Jess is in the front row? She must be so holy because she's in the front row. And she, she's willing to get spit on for Jesus. I mean, think about how holy you are. It's unbelievable. No, uh, and then the back row people. <laughs> Poor Nick. Look at him. He's just back there in the back. That guy can't. He's probably barely even a Christian. That guy back there. No, but so, so we make these kind of judgments, and your judgments might be different. You might be like, that dude's the saint, man. He's in the back. He's given up all the good seats in order to look how holy he is. Right? We even change the, the dynamic of, of our judging and condemning uh, based on what we do. And yet Jesus is saying, no, come follow me. I've got something better in store where you can move beyond judging and condemning one another. Uh, then he's also uh, asking you to uh, become people who forgive and become people who give. Now that just sounds so churchy and so easy. But you could spend a lot of time right there in that passage thinking about your ability to forgive and how hard it is. Uh, all you got to do is do the, the baby name book, go through the baby name book and just kind of go, come to a name where you're just like, I would never call my kid that name. Well, uh, you know what? You've never forgiven somebody that has that name is what it sounds like to me. Uh, all right. I mean, how many, I mean, I guess you could be Bartholomew. I guess I would never call my kid that and I don't know Bartholomew. 
But a lot of those names that we wouldn't call people are names that are associated with junk that we haven't forgiven. And Jesus is saying, come follow me. Move beyond being a person who can't forgive. Move beyond being a person who, who isn't a giver. Uh, and, and so this is all part of the Jesus way. And then finally, all of this is, is tying in to the whole message of Luke and Jesus' message of you have to take your faith and move it from your head and get it down to, to your heart. You have to move beyond the head. It, it simply won't do if it's only up here. So when I think of that, I think so easily because we're standing in a Lutheran church and I serve a Lutheran church to think of the creeds that we recite on a Sunday morning and think, uh, we, we pray the Lord's Prayer, we recite the Apostles' Creed, man, there's some good stuff in that. If you guys haven't been to a Lutheran service, and come and check out the liturgy. Come with a heart to see the Lutheran liturgy. If you come with a heart to see it, you're going to be like, I, I, I'm sitting there, and you know there's not a single extemporaneous prayer in the Lutheran liturgy. Every prayer is written for me. In fact, this is me praying at the Lutheran church. Dear Father, uh, be with it. Well, this is extemporaneous, so that's not me. But I've got one. I'm reading the prayer. They're beautiful prayers. They're, they're written by a person full of faith, full of a heart, right? It, his faith has moved from his head down to his heart, and he's written a beautiful prayer for us to listen to and to engage with in our hearts, not simply in our minds. And so I would invite you to come and check that out, but come with a heart, not just the mind. Because when you do that, then you're going to see the beauty behind the liturgy uh, and, and that's what we're trying to get even at the Lutheran Church is, hey, you've said it a thousand times, but let's continue to move it down into your heart and really live this out because, boy, there's some really good stuff here even in the liturgy. But that's Jesus' whole point. Uh, when he's speaking to a Jewish audience, he's speaking to people who could rattle off all kinds of commandments, could rattle off all kinds of uh, memorized things about their faith, and he's saying, no, 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 get it into your heart. Good deal that you can recite the Ten Commandments. But now let's get it into your heart so that you can live the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so this is the entire Jesus way of what he's doing. All right, he's now using a beautiful illustration to drive home his point. Y'all ready? Because I ain't got to do much preaching after I read this. Okay? In fact, I'm on vacation in... 14 verses. And if you believe that, yeah, you know me well enough to know that I won't. Uh, all right. Uh, now, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went into the Pharisee's house and took place at the table. Took his place at the table. Verse 37. Then when a woman of that town who was a sinner. Well, that's nice, isn't it? When a woman of that town who was a sinner. It's like, I mean, how's that distinguishing anybody from anybody? And there was a man who was a sinner. There's a, they could have said the Pharisee, that there was a sinner, invited Jesus over to, to his table. Uh, learned that Jesus was dining at the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfumed oil. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with perfumed oil. Now when the Pharisee had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, Say it, teacher. A certain man, a certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting. But from the time I entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. 
Thus she loved much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. Forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this person who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, this is just an an extreme contrast between two people. One who is living in the head and one who is living in the heart. It's the perfect illustration of exactly what Jesus is driving at as he speaks to regularly. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain were his, uh, his typical sermons that he's giving, uh, attempting to move people from a faith that is simply up here and move it into the heart. Uh, look at the Pharisee. Uh, we know from, from past chapters, uh, looking at these Pharisees, uh, that, that this was no, uh, think, of, think of just even the things that we talked about uh, the Jesus way or the contrast of the Jesus way. He, he's inviting Jesus over with a reciprocal motive in, in thought. He's in, inviting Jesus over with simply the physical uh, world in his head. He wants uh, Jesus to invite him back for dinner. He wants others to invite him back for dinner. Think of other illustrations that Jesus uses uh, as people, the host, is counting the cost of the meal of the invitees. Right? That, that's typical of somebody who's up here. W- when they take you out for dinner and, and they're looking at what you're going to order, they go, well, I didn't expect you to get the lobster. When I invited you out for lunch, I thought, you know, a burger, maybe. Fries. Uh, really, you're going to go with, with the lobster, huh? You see, that's a person that's hit, right here in the head. Uh, and, and again, they're, they're, they're emphasizing in their own, mind, their own mind this idea of going, uh, the reciprocal nature of life. That's one of the reasons why they think that, because they wouldn't do that in response. right? It's that reciprocity aspect. Now, look, uh, a reciprocal world... It's nice to live in a reciprocal world, but it's better to live in a world that goes beyond the reciprocal world. And so how nice is it when you go out to dinner and, they, and, and somebody says, don't even look at the price, don't, just what, get whatever you want. Whatever it is, just, just do it. Isn't that kind of nice? It, oh, we, we probably haven't experienced that too much because we live in a reciprocal world. Uh, and so we live in a world where people are counting the cost. And this Pharisee, it, it, he, he doesn't even have a spirit of welcomeness. Jesus is contrasting him and saying, look, all these things, you know, a typical host would do. And you haven't even done these things for me. And now you are going back to your natural inclinations to judge and to condemn. It, you're back stuck in your natural inclinations Uh, to not give, to not be a forgiver. This is a person who is wrapped up in the mind, a person who has not gone beyond. This is just the typical person. This is the typical person that's in the church. Did I say that out loud? This is the religious person, right? This is the religious person of the day, the Pharisees. The religious person of today is in the church, right? That's who Jesus is talking to. The one who kind of looks good, got their act together, can do something. They can can host a meal. They can take somebody out for lunch. But they're always doing it with just kind of the the wrong sense of things because they're stuck right up here in their mind, and they haven't allowed their faith to move to their heart. And so this is what we encounter in churches all the time. Have you ever met a hypocrite? Yeah, the hypocrites are in churches. That's where hypocrites live. The, the hypocrites don't live. Out, you expect people outside the world to act like this. You don't expect people inside the church to act like this. That's why they get the name hypocrite. Right? This is the Pharisees. They're hypocrites because they are simply up here with their, their faith and they have not moved down into their heart. Now, contrast this with the woman. Look at this woman. She's, it's, it's unbelievable. She, exactly. She is living the Jesus way. Okay, she is a sinner. 
But that's what all sin, uh, anybody who follows the Jesus way is a sinner, right? That's why when you walk through those doors, the common theme that, that unites us, we are sinners saved by grace. But don't forget the first part. We're sinners. Every one of us, when we walk through that door, we are sinners saved by grace. And she here is a sinner saved by grace, but she's living out the Jesus way. She's, she's a person who, uh, maybe like Socrates or, or some of the Greek philosophers would propose, know thyself. She knows herself. And because she knows herself, she knows who she is, and she knows the grace that Jesus offers. She is responding not from the head, but from the heart. And when you respond from the heart, you do crazy things. Like invite people out to dinner and say, get whatever on me. No, no, no. I, I really mean, get whatever you want. I'm not adding up. There's no little register in my mind going, click, 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 click. Get whatever you want. No, a person that lives from the heart is not somebody that's going around and coming into the church and looking at how people are dressed, looking at attendance, looking at where people sit, looking at how much they get involved. That's not somebody, that, that's somebody that's living from the mind. No, they're moving beyond that, and they're looking at each person and seeing, oh, that person's got value. That person can, could, could bring something good into my life. Oh, I want to hear that person's story. I want to get to know that person because I need them in my life. That's the person, uh, like this woman, who is living her faith out from her heart, not just from her head. You see, expense means nothing to her. It, it, this is unbelievable. She would uh, take a, a, a perfume bottle uh, and pour it over Jesus' feet and anoint her, his feet. This is somebody who recognizes grace and says, there's no way that I can possibly repay anybody for what I am getting from him. No, the healing, the, the spiritual healing that I am getting from him it, is bringing me life eternal and life abundant. There is no cost. There's nothing. There's, there's no physical cost in this world that could possibly pay back what I am getting from him. And so a, a perfume bottle, yes, I'll do that. I'll anoint his feet with oil to show him how much I love the fact that he has shown me grace and mercy. There's a huge difference between this woman and the Pharisee. It, and, and, and the huge difference is one is living from the head and one is living from the heart. One has a life that is characterized by the man way. The man way of being limited to the physical world. The man way of being limited to just this, this reciprocity. The man way of, of living according to your natural inclinations to judge, to condemn. The man way of not being a forgiver. The man way of not being giving. The man way of going, it's just up, up here. And then there's a woman who comes along and says, no, there's something that goes beyond all this. There's, there's, uh, because I've tasted it, I've seen it, I've seen the, the, the life eternal and life abundant, and I'm going beyond all that stuff. And, and what does Jesus do? Who does he honor? Well, obviously the one that's following the Jesus way. And he uses these two people as a contrast to be able to teach Simon, the Pharisee, first of all. Now, we all read this. We go, oh, he named, he named Simon. Well, that's, that, well, I, I, hope he, I hope he gets it. If you had to put money on it, do you think Simon got it? A man characterized by his faith up here, do you think he got it? Maybe. That's what the, the Word of God does transform hearts and minds of Aryan people, and, and takes them and humbles them. It's possible. But the more common reaction of a person who has their faith only in their mind, when they're challenged uh, to live the Jesus way, no, they'll respond with arrogance, pride, uh, lashing out, uh, even trying to kill the person. And Simon was part of a group of Pharisees, uh, a part of a group of a council who ultimately put Jesus to death. We don't know if Simon changed for sure, but if I had to put my money on it, 
if he's not going to allow his, his faith to get to his heart, then he's going to respond in a way that brings death because that's what people of the mind always do. Just think about that lunch. When they're adding up how much you're, you're, you're spending when you're, when you're ordering your food, uh, it's just bringing death. When people are judging and condemning you, it's just constantly bringing death. And that's so irritating that the church is full of people like this. This is the danger we all have uh, to, to face. Great book was written, Accidental Pharisee. We don't set out, nobody sets out and says, you know what, I was reading through the Bible and there's this group of people called the Pharisees. I, I think I want to become one. They seem like a, a you know, a group of people. Maybe not a good group, but a group. And I'd like to be part of a group. So I think I'm going to become a fair... No, we, it, it's an accident that we end up here. And it becomes because we, we, we stay living in a world that doesn't have potential to bring life. When Jesus is saying, Simon, church, go beyond. I've got life in store for you. Life abundant and life eternal. Father, the only way that we're going to be able to, to do this is we're going to have to know ourselves. The only way that we're going to ever be able to get to know ourselves is for your Holy Spirit to come and impress upon us the truth of who we are. We are sinners. And then he's going to have to impress upon us the gospel. And the gospel is that we have this ability to be able to receive grace. We hear the truth and, our, and we can respond to the grace. Father, this is what we need. Every one of us. There's nobody in here. We've got to know ourselves and know that we are more like the woman. And we need to be like her. To be open and honest with who we are in order that we might be able to receive that grace and be transformed. Father, I love you so much. I'm thankful for this illustration that you've given to really kind of begin to delineate this living by the head and living by the heart. Give us the power to be able to live by the heart. In Jesus' name.